Bullard, and I'm your ACL, I'm the ACLU of Virginia's Director of Communications. And I'd like to welcome you to our ACLU of Virginia and Northern Virginia Joint Annual Meeting. Before we get started, I wanted to share a couple of housekeeping items. We are providing a, an ASL interpreting services for our virtual meeting. There are two interpreters who are labeled as interpreter one and interpreter two, and we're very, very pleased that they're here to provide this service. We will be taking questions at the end of the presentation. If you have a presentation, if you have questions during the event, please use the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen to write your questions. And we will answer as many as possible during our Q&A portion. Thank you, and we'll get started with our program momentarily. Good morning, I'm Claire Guthrie Gastoniaga, the Executive Director of the ACLU of Virginia. I want to introduce the President of our Board of Directors, Steve Levinson. Steve? Uh, thank you, Claire. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Steve Levinson, and I have the great honor of serving as President of the ACLU of Virginia Board of Directors. Thank you all for being here for our annual meeting. During our program today, please give some real thought to the impact of our 51 years of civil rights and civil liberties work in Virginia and what that means to where we are now and where we can be in the future. The ACLU's work is never easy and it can be painstakingly slow at times, but the results have been and will continue to be a marked positive difference in the laws and public policies that affect all of us in public opinion and in the daily lives of every person who resides in our great Commonwealth. We hope that at the end of today's meeting, you will clearly see that our work has real impact on real people and you will appreciate the resilience shown by our clients, supporters, staff and organization. We also hope it will be clear why our work and your support are more important than ever. As we think about our mission to protect and expand civil rights and civil liberties for everyone, we realize that our success cannot be extracted or isolated from those who have contributed to it in any way, large or small. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. A um, little bit of technical difficulty, but I think um, you got, the, I hope you got the gist of Steve's welcoming message and he's going to come back and talk to you again at the end of today. I want to thank you again for being with us this morning. We are really excited to have this opportunity to tell you a bit about what we've been doing over the last year and what with your support we are planning to do in the future. Our program today will focus on our two most important priorities, voting and criminal legal reform. You'll hear from some of the people who inspire us and from members of our staff who are heading our work in these two areas. After our presentations, as, Inc., as Edith said, we will open the floor to your questions. So please use the Q&A function linked at the bottom of your screens to, to pose questions as the program proceeds. First, I want to talk a bit about the theme of this program and our annual report, which you can download from our webpage at ACLUVA.org. And there is a link in the chat that you can look at. Our theme today is resilience, the resilience of our organization and our staff, the resilience of people like you who support our work, and the resilience of people whom we serve and with whom we are working to make important policy changes in the courts and in the legislature. I recently read an article in the New York Times by Eileen Zimmerman that asked why some people are more resilient than others. And it seemed to me in reading that article that the answers to the, that question are pretty much the same answers to the question why some organizations are more resilient than others. Zimmerman says that for people, the most significant determinant of resilience 
is the quality of close personal relationships. She says the most resilient among us are people who generally don't dwell on the negative, who look for opportunities that might exist even in the darkest of times, that they are dedicated to a worthy cause or a belief in something greater than themselves. She also advises focusing energy on what can be changed and looking for meaningful opportunities in any difficult situation. And finally, she points out that resilient people do not go it alone. They find or develop a support system. In our case, I think there are three important factors that have allowed the ACLU of Virginia to be resilient as an organization. First, we have an amazing support system, all of you. The numbers on this slide, which Ingrid is going to put up for me now, tell a story about um, why we're able to continue to be able to make change in an increasingly hostile climate and to pivot when presented with challenges like COVID-19 and to respond effectively in situations like the kinds of things and, and protests against police violence we've seen since George Floyd's murder. You have helped grow our supporters and increased our financial foundation significantly since 2016. And without you, we wouldn't have the ability to do the work you're going to hear more about today. If you look at these numbers, we currently have 205,000 people in Virginia who are either our members or our supporters. We have had people in our, in our support group send over 6,000 emails and make calls on the issues that we are uh, seeking to make change, in which we are seeking to make change. And we've had almost 10,000 people access our Know Your Rights information, so they're better empowered to do the work. We've also benefited quite significantly uh, financially, and we are so grateful if you look at the revenue line and it says C4 contributions, those are contributions that support our advocacy work and they come mostly from small donors who have chosen to invest in our success. And we are so incredibly grateful that we, all of this has allowed us to grow from six people um, to, almost, to over 20 people on our staff. And I wanna show you next the second factor, which is our amazing staff. Since March, the folks featured in this slide have been working remotely, weathering the stresses of the pandemic, focusing their energy on what we can change in this dark time, and seizing opportunities to move us ahead whenever they've been presented. These folks whose numbers have grown from six to 20 with your strong support and whose effectiveness is enhanced by the power you choose to share when you take action, remain positive and optimistic, even when experiencing the trauma of our times personally. With you, they are dedicated to making the promise of our democracy real for all, to eliminating and dismantling the last vestiges of Jim Crow by upending the, the systems of white supremacy that continue to support it, and they are seeking racial justice at the ballot box in our criminal legal system. I hope you will join me in thanking these folks for their incredibly hard work. And finally, I want to say that the third factor is we are developing close relationships. As Brian Stevenson would say, we're trying to get more proximate with the people most directly impacted by the inequities and deprivations of liberty that we seek to address. You'll meet two of those people today who inspire us and help us each day to understand why we do the work we do and keep us optimistic and focused as we seek to change what we can. Again, thank you for being here. We wanna set the stage for the rest of this program by showing you a short video that introduces you to our work. The COVID-19 pandemic has fundamentally changed our lives and shown the enormous impact of systemic racism and inequities in America. Caught in between two pandemics, Black and Brown Virginians continue to bear the brunt of not only COVID-19, but also unjust, unfair systems that devalue their lives and leave them behind. Because of these critical issues, our present focus is on achieving three goals protecting the life and health of people who are incarcerated, 
protecting the right to vote during this pandemic and guaranteeing the right to vote for all, and reimagining the role of police in our society. Each of these goals is centered on ending structural racism and fixing systems that have targeted Black and Brown Virginians for generations. Together with our members and supporters, our community partners, and centering directly impacted people, the ACLU of Virginia is an unrelenting advocate for change in the courts, in the legislature, and with the public. We successfully sued the Virginia Board of Elections to waive the witness signature requirement on absentee ballots. We're suing the Richmond Police Department for their assaults on protesters. We're lobbying lawmakers on critical police reform issues in the current special session, and we're making sure that people know their rights during this critical time. We are also working to change hearts and minds through public education. For more than 50 years, the ACLU of Virginia has upheld our commitment to defend civil rights and civil liberties for everyone in Virginia. We will not back down or back off until we achieve equality and freedom for all, and systemic racism is no longer a hallmark of our civic and government institutions. And now we're going to move, I mean, yeah, please unmute is like the hallmark phrase of the time, isn't it? Um, we're going to move now to talking directly about our right to vote and the constitutional amendment that we hope you will join us in becoming strong advocates for. We we'll want to begin by introducing one of the people that inspires us to work for this change, Christopher Rashad Green. Christopher is a community activist, a, motion, a motivational speaker, and the founder of Free Dome Unlimited. He's a formerly incarcerated person who now as a political organizer and health equity advocate is on a journey to empower men, women, and children in overcoming the challenges and injustices of the criminal legal system. He now works as a community organizer at the Virginia New, New Virginia Majority, where he leads the court watch of Central Virginia. Christopher has had his right to vote restored, a right he says empowered him to fight for the rights of other incarcerated people. Christopher, uh, you're, we're ready to hear your, your story. Thank you, Claire. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, my name is Christopher Rashad Green. As Claire has said, I'm a formerly incarcerated uh, returning citizen. I'm an activist and an advocate here in the Richmond region and in our state. And I've been blessed to use my gifts of discernment and empathy to articulate my emotional experiences in the criminal legal system. Uh, as a high school student, actually I was an honor student, I actually entered the school to prison pipeline at the age of 15. And for a period of four years, I experienced over 15 years of incarceration and other obstacles such as homelessness, addiction, mental health, domestic violence, and a host of other social determinants. And because of felony disenfranchisement, I was unable to participate in elections for over 30 years. And then about seven years ago, I realized the importance of voting and learned of the systemic changes that are needed for all of us to participate in our electoral process. And so as I voted for the first time in over 30 years in the 2016 presidential election and saying that that moment really, I think of the word being empowered. I was really empowered by that, by that action, by that decision to enter into politics, into the electoral process and empowered me with a new mindset and had me on this path, which you know, act, I'm actively advocating for other formerly incarcerated and disenfranchised folks in Virginia. And as a community organizer, I've helped thousands of Virginians with voter registration and getting their votes, their voting rights restored. That is a real passion of mine. And so I'm currently now I'm leading the New Virginia Majority's Constitutional Amendment Campaign for the automatic restoration of voting rights. I'm the lead organizer and, and my role and my job is to mobilize community members who are directly impacted by voter disenfranchisement here in Central Virginia. And I also recently launched a new 501c3 reentry initiative called Freedom Unlimited, which is a transformative and holistic approach to addressing recidivism and all those social determinants of health. And I'm so grateful for the ACLU, them, and New Virginia Majority, and other partner organizations we formed a right to vote coalition to champion 
a constitutional amendment that guarantees that all Virginia citizens over the age of 18 have the right to vote. So that nearly half a million returning citizens such as myself, those who are directly impacted by Virginia's racist constitution, we don't lose our right to participate in our democracy. So in 2021, the Virginia General Assembly has the opportunity to amend this racist voter suppression laws that have been left behind from the Jim Crow era. Virginia is only one of three states that permanently disenfranchises folks with a felony conviction unless the governor restores it on an individual basis. That's nearly 500,000 Virginians who have lost their voice but are also expected to pay taxes. And voting is a right promised to all, to all Americans, all American citizens in order to give them a voice and who governs them. So it's time to speak up and make a change, not remain silent and complicit to a law whose creation was rooted in racism and oppression. Thank you so much for having me and please join our fight, our, join our fight, join our right to vote campaign. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christopher. Your story inspires all of us to work harder to ensure that the right to vote is something that government can't take away from anyone, anytime. The right to vote belongs to the people. And now I am really honored to introduce a true legislative champion to talk about her work in helping to secure the right to vote for all. Dr. Locke is a professor of political science at Hampton University who has served in the Virginia legislature since 2004. Before her election to the Senate, Senator Locke was on city council and served as the mayor of Hampton. In the Senate, she serves as the chair of the Senate Democratic Caucus. She has been a voice for racial justice in the Senate since her election. And in addition to championing the right to vote amendment in the, to the Virginia Constitution, she was a leading architect and patron of Senate Bill 5030, the Senate's comprehensive police reform bill that passed this week, and which if passed by the House and signed by the governor, would bring transformational change to policing in Virginia. It's my honor to introduce Senator and Professor Mamie Locke. Thank you so much, Claire, and good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning, and I'm certainly honored uh, to speak here today. Uh, the late great Congressman and civil rights leader, John Lewis, spent his entire life fighting for voting rights. It is a right for which we, he nearly lost his life at the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama in 1965. I'd like to point out what Dr. William Barber of North Carolina, head of the Poor People's Campaign said, when Mitch McConnell deigned to speak um, as the late Congressman lay in state at the US Capitol, Rotunda. Dr. Barber said, uh, he was reminded of Jesus's admonishment to the Pharisees. I live near um, Langley, so you hear planes flying over, so I'm, I apologize. Uh, Dr. Barber said that he was reminded of Jesus's admonishment to the Pharisees uh, in building tombs to prophets when Mitch McConnell dared to speak um, at John, John Lewis's uh, land and state. Uh, Reverend Barber said, and I quote, we don't need to be talking about how hard and how great it was that John Lewis stood so firm against injustice. What we need to be doing is repenting and saying we're going to make it so nobody ever has to give their life for basic racial justice. It is, it is Mitch McConnell who is blocking passage of the amended Voting Rights Act that John Lewis had risked his life for back in 1965. So if we truly want to honor the memory of John Lewis and the thousands of others who fought and died as he did for what was right, then we need to do what's right right now. We have a president of the United States who is asking citizens to commit a felony by voting twice come this November. He is, caused, he is casting aspersions on the U.S. Postal Service and demonizing voting by mail, although he, it's okay for him to vote absentee, but it's not okay for others to do the same thing. We must live up to John Lewis's legacy and his final marching orders to us in his final essay that was written uh, after his death. He said, when you see something that is not right, you must say something. You must do something. 
Democracy is not a state, it is an act. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. The ACLU is absolutely correct, and Claire was absolutely correct when she said that the right to vote belongs to the people. If it did not belong to the people, there would not be all these efforts to suppress it or block it. Virginia had already bought into felony disenfranchisement laws when Black codes establishing severe penalties for petty crimes particularly targeting African Americans following the Civil War were put into place. Virginia also solidified its efforts at disenfranchisement when it held its 1902 Constitutional Convention, severely restricting African Americans' right to vote by imposing poll taxes and literacy tests that Christopher already talked about. In the aftermath of Barack Obama's election in 2008, Virginia engaged in his so-called voter fraud scheme and the myth and began the campaign of we need photo ID and put that into place. It is past time that we correct this egregious behavior that Virginia has been engaging in for over a century. We have already begun with no excuse absentee voting and photo ending photo ID. But in order to guarantee the right to vote for all Virginians, we must enact a concise constitutional amendment that repeals current discriminatory limits on the right to vote and insert an affirmative right to vote in Virginia that cannot be abridged by law. Everyone should have basic right in Virginia in a representative democracy. Full citizenship requires the ability to have a voice in government. The constitutional amendment, which will be introduced in the 2021 session, simply addresses the qualification of voters. It makes it clear that every citizen has an equal voice in Virginia and can participate in this democracy without restriction if one is at least 18 years of age, a US citizen and a Virginia resident. Now, don't get me wrong, Christopher has already indicated his role in this process. It is not going to be easy to get this done. We must introduce this legislation, which will be done in the 2021 session. The proposal has to pass both the House of Delegates and the Senate of Virginia. There has to be an intervening election of the House of Delegates, then this proposal has to pass again uh, in the identical wording of the proposed amendment uh, and it has to pass both chambers again uh, the house of delegates and the senate a second time and then the amendment has to be approved by virginia voters by a referendum in order to be placed into the virginia constitution that is not an easy task it's going to take all of us, all of our collective efforts to get this work done. So let's go for it. We can do it because it is our right to participate in, in this democracy with our vote. So let's go get it. We can get it done. Thank you so much, Senator. We are so grateful to have you as a partner in this process. And I don't think any of us um, diminish in any way the the hill the size of the hill that we have to climb but i know that we are ready and i know that the people listening here today are ready and i know we can get this done all we have to do is look at the struggle that florida is having um, to know how difficult and how hard people will fight you know florida passed a, a, an amendment that restored rights to 1.4 million people but the legislature then did a fancy dance and created poll taxes to try to keep people who had gotten their rights back from exercising them. And unfortunately, yesterday, that poll tax was upheld by the 11th Circuit Federal Court of Appeals by an, uh, one vote you know, in a split panel. So we're looking at, obviously, a, a fight in Florida. And so I think it's even more important than in Virginia. We say 
no one is left out, no one is left behind. This is something that everyone uh, gets when they turn 18. And in Virginia, if you're a citizen and a resident and you're 18 or over, you have a, the ability and the right to vote that government cannot take away from you or limit in any way. And I think that, that you know, the struggle is worth it and the, and the victory will be incredibly sweet with all of your help and Senator with you leading the charge. I know we can get this done. So thank you so much for being with us this morning and for inspiring us to, to do this important work. I wanna turn now to our uh, Director of Advocacy, Jenny Glass, who is leading our advocacy work and her work is informed by years of experience working for policy change and leading field efforts and political campaigns. And she's gonna talk more about what's happening with voting rights uh, in general. And I think she's gonna underscore a point that the Senator made, which is that we've made some huge advances, but all of those advances are in jeopardy if we don't have a constitutional amendment that makes it clear we can never go back. Jenny? That's right. Um, thank you, Claire. Thank you, Senator Locke. And, and thank you, Christopher, for sharing your story um, and, and welcome everybody. Um, we really appreciate your support to be able to do this work. Um, you know, it's not too often that we have any reason to celebrate um, in 2020, uh, but we have made some tremendous gains uh, for voting rights in the last General Assembly session. And Virginia has long been notorious for some of the most rigid and discriminatory voting laws in the country. Um, but last year brought a lot, of, um, a lot of hope and a lot of promise that I think we can make some changes for the better. Uh, but, but like the Senator said, Claire said, and, and I will underscore everything that, that Christopher said, you know, without a permanent uh, reform here, without a constitutional amendment, we could see all of these gains lost um, very quickly. So we're going to start with reforms. Uh, I want to talk about some of these today. I'm going to start with reforms that were made to the absentee voting process. Um, you know, last year, Virginia made absentee voting easier, more accessible, and more equitable uh, for, you know, we eliminated excuses. So there's no more excuses. We passed a bill that you had to qualify. Um, sorry, before we, have, we passed this bill, you had to qualify to vote through one of 17 reasons uh, that would have given you the ability to vote absentee. Um, and as of July 1, you no longer need an excuse to vote absentee. So um, you can drop off your mail-in absentee ballot or you can vote absentee early in person between September 18th and October 31st without needing to write any excuse. Um, we also passed prepaid postage for returning your absentee ballot. And Vishal is gonna talk, um, our senior staff attorney is gonna talk a little bit more uh, next about how this has already gone into effect. But the good news is that it's actually gonna be the law of the land um, come 2021. Um, registrars will now have to provide uh, prepaid postage for, absent, sorry, for absentee ballots. Um, and this is going to make absentee voting a lot more accessible uh, and remove what may seem like a small kind of burden for some. It's, it's a really huge burden for others to pay for the postage to return, um, to return their ballot in the mail. You're also going to see getting more time uh, to get your mail-in absentee ballot counted. So if you mail in your absentee ballot, it does need to be postmarked by November 3rd and received by your registrar uh, by noon on November 6th, but that's the Friday after the election. So for that to be counted. Um, so getting a couple more, few more extra days in there. Um, and also just, you know, don't forget the re absentee ballot request deadline is October 23rd. But that is actually new as well. So a recent bill actually changed the deadline uh, for applying for an absentee ballot from seven to 11 days to give registrars a little more time to ensure that it's counted. So just as an absolute reminder, make sure uh, you request your absentee ballot by mail by October 23rd. You can go to the next one. So we also increased accessibility a little bit and uh, increased a little more um, accountability. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry. Um, we're going to talk about voter registration first. So um, we actually passed a really awesome reform for automatic voter registration. So starting July 1, if you're conducting any form of transaction when you're at the DMV or you're accessing the website and you're not registered to vote or you need to update your registration, the DMV is going to automatically register you to vote uh, as long as you're qualified. Um, so the new system is actually opt out, which is great. It's not giving you any option really other than saying, I actually really don't want to do this. Um, we also, you know, help get voter registration forms and materials into places that have been a little harder to access. So helping high schoolers get registered. Um, there was a bill passed that would require public schools to provide 
voter registration materials to all students um, who are eligible to register and offer actually time to complete the registration um, during the school day. Um, in addition, some other voter registration forms that pass that were really great, um, providing notice of a denial for voter registration. Um, when I worked in campaigns, this would happen a lot where you might go out, and I'm sure the Virginia majority is familiar with it too. Um, you go out and you would register people to vote, and, and unfortunately, if something was wrong on the form, you know, they may not actually find out until they went to vote that day um, on election day. So this actually requires the general registrar to notify anyone um, who has applied to vote and has been denied within five days of getting that denial. So they have an opportunity to come back and do that again. Um, and we just generally are creating more opportunities um, to register. So there have been, like I said, some places where you were a little more difficult, um, but this actually allows us uh, for people to be registering people to vote at naturalization ceremonies at high schools. It just creates a little bit more opportunity. Now we're going to go back and talk about accountability um, and accessibility. So often reforms um, allowing for an election day holiday uh, for Virginia on the first Tuesday in November so that people can uh, not have to worry about you know, taking time off of work or having this really small window of time um, in order to get to the polls. So it's going to be a state recognized holiday starting this year. Um, we're also providing more accessible ballots and materials. This isn't going to go into effect until September. Um, of this year, but starting in September, the State Board of Elections is going to provide voting and election materials in languages other than English. Um, and then the last reform that's sort of increasing accountability for elections is just keeping better records of voting. Um, now the State Board of Elections is going to be required to keep a record of your ballot, whether it was cast on the machine or on paper. So this is going to help increase accuracy during the recount um, and create a lot more credibility for election results. We could definitely use that right now. Um, you can go to the next slide. Um, Virginia has, um, I, I think Senator Locke mentioned this, um, that you know Virginia passed its most restrictive voter ID laws back in the mid 2000s, um, but it really did start that process, you know, long ago of, of just kind of slowly chipping away at uh, at your ability to come in and and bring a document and show who you were and and trying to make it a lot more restrictive for you to actually access the ballot. As of July 1, very happy to say that you can now vote using a range of identification. It should sound pretty familiar. Um, you can now bring in a voter registration card, a bank statement, a utility bill, a paycheck, um, any government issued document that shows your name and address. Um, and of course, just like always any DMV issued ID, uh, passport or a driver's license. And even if you don't actually have um, any of these forms of ID, you can actually still vote and you, you can still vote and not have to vote provisionally. Um, voters who don't show a voter identification card can now sign a, uh, this is something we had previously, I think back in 2012, um, you can now sign an affidavit that says, this I am who I say I am um, under penalty of a class five felony. So it's not exactly great, but it is an opportunity to be able to vote if you don't have one of those identification uh, that were listed there to still be able to do it and cast your ballot that day. Uh, and finally, um, my, my personal favorite reform of last year, um, because you know, I think the ACLU of Virginia is pretty instrumental in helping pass this bill, um, creating a system of early one-stop voting in Virginia um, in 2022. So uh, same-day voter registration um, is probably one of the most impactful reforms you can have um, uh, for voting. Um, you can make a, a voting system that increases turnout, um, especially among lower income individuals and voters of color. So starting in 2022, uh, Virginia will join the ranks of 19 other states that have adopted some form of election day or same day voter registration. So what this bill does is it eliminates voter registration deadlines and it allows an eligible voter to register to vote and cast their ballot on the same day. So you could also register to vote year round. You would no longer have to worry about meeting some deadline, an arbitrary deadline, you know, two or three weeks out from the election. Um, and then, you know, maybe a lot of people actually, you know, realize that there's an election maybe two or three weeks out and then they can't participate. Um, once this bill goes into effect, you'll be able to register to vote. You can cast your vote um, on the same day. And it's gonna be a really, really amazing reform um, for a lot of folks. It's gonna allow a lot more accessibility to the ballot. Um, so really excited for that to be implemented. And we're gonna have to make sure that as it gets implemented, nothing kind of 
changes within it and we can figure out how to actually make it make it possible for Virginia. But I'm looking forward to that in 2022. Um, I think all of this really is to underscore that there are so many wonderful reforms that were passed, but there's a, an urgency that I feel, and I think everyone in this call feels, and probably everyone that's listening feels that um, there's an importance on not going back to the way it was. And we feel like we have a road to this you know, right to vote constitutional amendment that has to be followed without these reforms, you know, without the political will um, to pass a permanent right to vote, we might see a really, um, really big shift going backwards. So we need to pass an affirmative right to vote in our state constitution to ensure that none of these reforms get reversed. Like Christopher said, Virginia is one of only three states that permanently disenfranchises people with a felony conviction, which means that nearly half a million Virginians potentially um, can not vote simply because they have a felony conviction. And the process for getting your writing, voting rights back in Virginia, um, it can only go so far. And so we just really have to keep in mind that uh, the principle of this is that no one should have ever had it taken away to begin with. So I wanna share some updates with um, the right to vote campaign that Christopher mentioned. You know, together with New Virginia Majority, uh, we helped form the right to vote coalition back in late 2019. Uh, our goal is pretty simple. We wanna end felony disenfranchisement uh, by passing a constitutional amendment by 2022 that will guarantee the right to vote for every citizen and Virginia resident over the age of 18. The coalition has um, some wonderful committees that are working on you know, the different variety of tactics that we feel we need to have in place in order to get this passed in a short time span here. We have our lobbying wing, we have organizing and communication wings. And right now the uh, coalition is currently working on um, designing and executing a campaign launch in a form of an art exhibit that we're partnering with, with the Richmond Public Library um, and BCU's Common Book series. Um, the Common Book this year is No Person, One Person, No Vote. Um, and it's actually about the history of disenfranchisement and voter suppression. So the exhibit's gonna focus on the history there so that we can show those racist roots that Christopher was talking about. Um, we are actively lobbying the Senate uh, and persuading Senate Privileges and Elections Committee um, on our path to victory, but we really need your help. We want you to join this campaign. We want you to talk to your legislators. Um, <laughs> thank you, Ingrid, for keeping up with my, my, my shifting pace here. Um, we should tell your legislators the right to vote about the right to vote a minute um, and tell them that it's really important to pass this this year. So I have a, a handful of legislators that I would love um, if anyone listening um, is, is in these folks' districts or you know this is your senator, um, pro deeds would be wonderful to reach out to um, and, and talk to about this amendment. If you also, if you need any materials um, and want to get back in touch with us about that, please do um, to be able to have these kinds of conversations. But I'm going to list off a handful more. Um, Janet Howell, Joel Vogel, uh, Senator Lyle Spruill, uh, Senator Scott Cerival, Senator Monty Mason, Jennifer Boisco, and John Bell. These would all be wonderful folks to reach out to um, about the amendment. So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Claire. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jenny. That was incredibly informative. And I think it's, uh, it, it just puts the, the path forward clearly in, in front of us. And, um, you know, I do think it's wonderful and we should celebrate the fact that we've moved from being one of the most difficult states to vote in in the nation to one of the easier states to vote in, but we can only secure that for the future by passing a constitutional amendment. Um, now we're going to hear from ACLU of Virginia's senior staff attorney, Vishal Agraharkar. Vishal came to us from a civil rights litigation fellowship and with years of experience at the Brennan Center doing integrated advocacy work around voting rights. And he's going to be talking about our work to make voting accessible and safe during the pandemic. Vishal? Thanks, Claire. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Vishal Agraharkar, and I'm the senior staff attorney at the ACLU of Virginia. Um, thank you all for being here and for um, supporting us in all of our work. Um, to follow up on Jenny's presentation and, and some of the uh, other remarks we've heard about the right to vote, I wanted to talk a bit about some of the unique challenges that have arisen during the pandemic with respect to voting and about um, one lawsuit that we brought to relax a requirement that was uh, imposing a burden on many voters 
uh, given the pandemic and given the social distancing guidelines. Um, so you can't talk about uh, barriers to the vote during the pandemic without talking about voting by mail. Um, even before the pandemic, absentee voting by mail has been increasing in importance for many years, um, but given, um, especially given the reforms to absentee voting, uh, some of which Jenny was talking about, um, that were set to go into effect in 2020, registrars were already expecting a big surge in absentee ballot applications and absentee ballots, and then the pandemic hit. So to give you a sense of how much of an impact it had immediately, if you look at May 2016, um, the elections that were held then, about 4% of Virginians voted absentee by mail. And then in May uh, 2020, that number went up to 55%. Um, and these are just in low turnout elections uh, where people were probably not expecting long lines at the polls as much as they would be in a general election. Um, mail-in ballots, uh, the problem with that is, is that mail-in ballots have a much higher rejection rate than in-person ballots for a number of reasons. They get rejected for arriving late. Um, so in the presidential primary in Virginia in 2020, about 5% of uh, Virginia's mail-in ballots were rejected for being returned late, which is uh, among the highest, if not the highest rates in the country. They also get rejected uh, if something wasn't filled out correctly on the ballot envelope, which is an extra hurdle that, um, of course, voters don't face if you're voting in person. Um, so those can include things like uh, address information, the voter's signature, and in Virginia and uh, I think 11 other states, the signature of a witness, or in some, some of the other states, it's an, of a notary. Um, and while much of the information required on the ballot envelope is important information that you want to get from voters who aren't voting in person, you also want a system that doesn't disenfranchise someone for a mistake. And you definitely don't want a system that disenfranchises someone for uh, following public health guidelines or avoiding putting their own health and safety at risk. Um, and in fact, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, we uh, later learned that uh, the witness requirement could have had um, a big impact in Virginia, that uh, you know, one expert uh, concluded that just looking at the numbers of um, votes that were actually rejected in the May election, where we had that in place, uh, around 17,000 voters um, who could or, or would vote a, a ballot in November would have that ballot rejected. And that doesn't even include voters who might not vote in the first place um, because of the requirement. And so um, like so many other um, restrictions or requirements on the right to vote, it also had a disproportionate impact on certain populations. Um, and uh, it, it, those populations included black voters, voters over the age of 65, voters with disabilities and low income voters who are more likely than others to live alone. And, Incidentally, those are also populations that um, tend to face disproportionate health impacts from COVID-19. So what did we do? Um, well, we had started to hear from some people who were considering voting in the upcoming May elections um, and who were living alone and social distancing and didn't know um, what to do about the, the witness requirement. And so that prompted us to do a bit more thinking about the issue and put out a call um, for others who might be in the same boat. Uh, eventually, we sent a letter to Governor Northam with several recommendations on how to safely expand access to voting by mail, um, including by eliminating the witness requirement, uh, making mail ballots more accessible, to expand locations where they can be dropped off, give voters an opportunity to correct mistakes if they sent some uh, ballot in that had a problem with it. And finally, um, to make sure that uh, in-person voting um, is maintained as an important uh, uh, safeguard on the, uh, uh, for people who need it to make sure that it can be done as safely as possible. So we, um, when we didn't get the response that we wanted from, from the letter, we, we did bring a lot lawsuit on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Virginia and several other individual voters um, challenging the enforcement of the signature requirement, the witness requirement during the pandemic. So in April, along with the, um, our co-counsel at the ACLU's National uh, Voting Rights Project, we filed a federal lawsuit 
um, uh, challenging the requirement, bringing claims under the constitutional right to vote and also under the Voting Rights Act. Um, and soon after we brought the lawsuit, uh, we filed for a preliminary injunction. We, we actually reached an agreement with the state to lift the requirement for the June primary and um, the federal court approved that agreement. And we were unfortunately not able to lift it for the May elections. And we did see hundreds of ballots get rejected in that low turnout election. Um, but the, for the June primary, it was lifted. And then as the pandemic progressed, um, we moved again for a preliminary injunction for the November election. And again, um, we reached an agreement with the state and um, the, uh, rather than fighting with us, they, um, we ag agreed um, to, to lift the, elect, uh, the requirement for the November general election. We did have um, some outside parties uh, and groups fighting us on this, but the federal court approved our agreement. And um, that means that voters this November will have one less hurdle to vote absentee. In, uh, so this slide actually shows, just zooming out a little bit, um, our co-counsel in this litigation, the National Voting Rights Project of the ACLU, of National ACLU has been um, instrumental in not just helping us bring in this case, but bringing similar cases around the country. Um, so altogether, they filed 20 lawsuits protecting um, the right to vote, um, particularly by mail in light of the, the, the pandemic. Um, most recently, uh, they got a good decision yesterday uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, and actually, uh, the template map didn't come with uh, Puerto Rico for some reason, so I had to draw, draw that in. Um, but add that, add that to the slide here, uh, last second. Um, okay, now the next slide um, shows that uh, it was also a legislative response. And um, in recent weeks, the, the Virginia legislature has, has been tackling some of the issues uh, specific to voting in a pandemic through the, uh, through the budget amendment. Um, and so as a result, the state has um, passed a number of reforms. Um, there are going to be drop-off locations um, for November 2020, um, where uh, that, that would allow for ballot drop-offs, absentee ballot drop-offs at the registrar's office, voter satellite offices, um, polling place locations, and any other locations that the registrar establishes. And um, those will, the instructions for that will be included for all of the, uh, with all the absentee ballots. There's also some funding for prepaid postage for mail, uh, for absentee ballots. Um, those, uh, that prepaid postage funding is something that's gonna continue going forward, um, but the funding was, was included in this bill. There's also, and if, if you'll remember, you know, one of the things that we had um, asked for in our letter uh, was an opportunity to cure um, ballots that are sent in and where there's some kind of material omission on the ballot envelopes. Um, so this reform for November 20 would, would require the state to give notification to voters who um, incorrectly, inadvertently completed um, their ballot envelopes without a signature or uh, maybe a, a mistake in their address or something like that and give them until the third day after the election to cure. Um, so uh, th those are some good reforms that were passed. Uh, the next steps, however, are to pass some of these reforms, um, uh, including the opportunity to cure, um, to make sure that there are drop-off locations going forward um, for future elections and to uh, codify um, some of these, these changes that were made. And of course, um, finally, to, uh, you know, as part of our, um, our push to, to guarantee a right to vote, um, to all um, Virginian citizens over the age of 18 that can't be taken away. Um, you know, a lot of these kinds of reforms are about making sure that that right is also as accessible as possible to everyone. Um, so we're hoping for a successful uh, next couple of years where we can guarantee that right. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vishal. Lots of good work that's been done and, and uh, obviously an agenda for a lot of hard work ahead. I want to, we're going to switch now from talking about voting to focusing on our work to reform and reimagine policing and to protect the rights of those who are protesting police violence. I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Earl Lewis Jr. who will share his story as a person who was directly impacted by police violence. 
Earl Lewis Jr. has been an infantry non-commissioned officer for 13 years in the U.S. Army. Hoorah, except that's the Marines. Anyway, um, a Department of Navy Federal Firefighter and an EMT for more than 20 years. He's going to share his story of how the senseless death of his cousin, William Chapman, led him to becoming an activist for police and gun reform. Mr. Lewis, welcome. Thank you so very much. I really want to thank uh, ACLU right, for giving me the opportunity. This is a great opportunity. But also, before I even start, I want to thank Senator Lucas, right? When my cousin first died, she donated $1,000 within seconds. I say that to say this because once you lose a loved one and you're not expecting it at 18 years old, it takes life to a change. Well, like she said, my name is Earl Lewis. I'm a cousin of William Chapman. William Chapman was killed by a Portsmouth, Virginia police officer in 2015, actually April the 22nd. Uh, when he was murdered, unfortunately, right, this police officer had killed somebody back in 2011 that he shot 11 times. I tell you them numbers, you just cannot imagine. They come together. But you know what was so crazy about this situation, my cousin was killed April the 22nd, 2015, the police officer killed someone back in 2011, April the 23rd. Imagine that. So now what you have is two mothers really going through it. The system is definitely broken. If this police officer who was not found guilty of shooting the, the first individual, okay, was, which was in 2011, he had the opportunity to sit down. So here you go, four years later, he gets up, he shoots my cousin. But the crazy thing about them, he shot my cousin, her cousin's hands was up. He said, you're gonna shoot me. And he shot him in his nose, he didn't shot him in his heart. You know? And what's so sad about that, that now what do they do? They handcuff him. So when they handcuff him and blood is going, every bleeding from, you know, from his head and from his heart, but yet and still, you know, you gonna give CPR. I'm telling y'all the system is broken. And being that I've given my life for my country, for my community, you know, and coming back as a veteran and being involved, it just broke my heart. It just totally broke my heart. With that being said, the loss of my cousin, sad. But two people lost because this police officer did not become decertified. He had the opportunity to kill again. And he was investigated by the state. And this case was so big, it went all the way up to Washington, D.C. because of the first man. Somewhere along the line, we used excessive force. And these police officers are able to be rehired, you know? And that's a sad thing. I talked to police, I talked to a police chief, and he said, Earl, I do all I can. But he go to the person, go to the next city, and they're able to be rehired, you know? So these are like some key points that we really need you know, talk about. Now, with that being said, five years of holding on to this, it's a whole lot of time. So I have a long conversation, but I know I can't do that. Next thing is making sure accountability. You know, these certification of that police officer to make sure that he cannot go nowhere else, right, and become a police officer in no other city. So we have to make sure that happens for accountability. Also, qualified immunity, okay? Making sure that we as a citizen can sue that police officer. I say that to say this because what I found that the, the city would step up and say, well, no, we don't, we gonna take, we gonna help the police officer out and we gonna basically give you a settlement. So police officer never get sued. But we need to be able to hit home you know, hit home because once a man uh, who's credible in the community shoots another man and he gets away with it, he gets to go home. This man just realized he gonna just get the opportunity to sit down for give or take 30, 40 days. In our community, men have been shot by police officers over and over. And the police officer get the, what, two and a half years for shooting a man in the head and in the heart, my cousin. Something's wrong with that. But that being said, what I will say, in the state of Virginia, we stood up. We stood up and we fought this man all the way to Virginia to Supreme Court. So he's a felon now. So he can no longer work in any other state. 
in the United States of America. But we, the people of Virginia, stood together. And we're talking about the system is broken, yes, but the system can be fixed if we work together. This case is so many twists and turns, and I truly believe if we can come together with the ACLU and work as a whole, and from beginning to ending, that we can get justice for everybody. But with that being said, they passed, a, well, they were trying to pass a Senate bill, which was 50 13, and I guess it didn't go through. Qualified immunity. And you're trying to pass a bill, and the people like myself don't show up and speak about it. Guess what? It don't happen. It don't happen. Because, see, this is a mother of a child. This is a mother of a child. The very first day, tears in her eyes, and that hurts. You know, nobody sees that. Right, and there's so many mothers. I've been from the East Coast to the West Coast talking about this. So we need to look at a mother like Sally Chapman and other mother who lost her son. And they need to let us speak. We the people, my credentials speak for themselves. And whenever you shoot someone in our nation, in our country, as one may say, or in our community, they're connected to a veteran. And that's what people need to realize. If I'm willing to die for my country, how can you shoot William Chapman in the head and the heart? And guess what? That mother hurts when she basically has to go to where? To the graveyard. She goes, she was going to the graveyard just because she, she couldn't get no peace. And we were asked, where is Sally Chapman at? She's at the graveyard, hurting for her son. This never goes away. See, this is why they don't want us to speak up. But I'm telling you, this is a man fight. This is a man fight. It took a man to kill my cousin. It's going to take a man to stand up to a man. So I'm asking all the men around America, and especially even in Virginia, to stand up, along with the mothers. And as a man, I stood up. Not only for Sally, I stood up for my people in Virginia. But it took the people of Virginia to come together, white, black, and everybody came together, right? The police department that was up there, the good cops came together, okay? Fire department came together. Everybody came together working on one accord. Hopefully I hit everything, but I just want you to know that all we ask for is to definitely support ACLU moving forward and helping us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Lewis, for sharing your story. I'm really sorry that the Senate chose to vote on House Bill 5013, the Qualified Immunity Bill, without allowing people like you to have a chance to give public testimony as to why it should pass. And um, we're going to keep working on making sure that the reforms that you talk about, decertification, which is in Senator Locke's bill, and a number of other things that Ashna Khanna is just going to talk about in just a second, actually come to fruition. But with your help and, and, and your being out there and telling your story, we have a better chance to make things happen because real life experiences are what help policymakers understand uh, why change is needed. So thank you so much for being with us this morning. Ashna, um, Ashna Khanna is our legislative director. She came to us from the ACLU of Michigan. And she's been uh, working really hard and doing some amazing work to develop our legislative program and our legislative muscle over the last couple of years. She's going to talk about what's happening in the current special session and what still needs to be done. And I think she may be ending with a call to action. Uh, Ashna? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Claire said, my name is Ashna Kanda, and I'm the legislative director for the ACLU of Virginia. I just want to take a moment to recognize and thank everyone for being here. And I especially want to thank and recognize Christopher and Earl for sharing their stories. These are unprecedented times that we are living in. It has been emotional, tiring, and inspirational to see community come together to demand change and justice. The tragic murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and recent protests have shown an urgent need for fundamental changes in our society, and especially in policing. We must confront the racism that has been baked into our society. And one place that systematic racism shows up is policing. It is a fact that black and brown communities face higher rates of arrests, prosecution, convictions, and harsher sentencing. 
It is unfair. It is inhumane. And unfortunately, the system is working exactly the way that it was intended to. And we will need to break down and change the system to address these issues. We have seen black and brown people harmed or killed by the police over and over again with no avenue for justice. And these unfortunate events have pushed people of all races and backgrounds to demand reform in policing. We must reimagine the role that police play in our society. And one way we can overcome the results of systematic racism is by holding the police accountable. On August 18th, the Virginia legislature came together and called a special session with two expressed purposes, right? One, to address COVID-19, and the other to address police reform. And as the ACLU, we viewed this as the perfect opportunity to get two police accountability issues on the table and push for them. One was decertification, and the other ending qualified immunity. This is not new work for us. You know, and our theme today is resilience. And this is an issue we've needed to show great resilience on and we will continue to need to do so as well. Along with us, Black activists, grassroots organizers, and many legislators have been calling for these police reforms for years. And after years of inaction, we viewed the special session as a time to make change happen. But first, let me share a little bit more about these issues, right? Let's talk a little bit about what decertification is, what it looks like in Virginia, and the same with qualified immunity. In Virginia, there's only a handful of ways for a police officer to lose their state certificate, which gives them a license to work in law enforcement. They must be charged or convicted of a felony or certain misdemeanors, fail a drug test, or fail to do their mandatory training. We need statewide standards that allow a license to police to be suspended or revoked for misconduct on the job, criminal or not. Our lax policing law means that there was no real accountability for officers who engage in excessive use of force or unethical conduct. And often, police who have been cited for misconduct, including using excessive use of force, resign or are fired, but then are simply rehired to find another job in another Virginia jurisdiction. We must break the cycle of firing and rehiring police officers. Law enforcement is held to one of the lowest standards of conduct. Let me repeat that once again. Law enforcement in Virginia is held to one of the lowest standards of conduct that will result a police officer from being unable to police. This is disheartening to hear. Nationwide, about 30,000 cops have been decertified and are no longer able to get a job in law enforcement. Virginia has only contributed 33 officers to that list. That is less than 1%. And we know that there are many more you know, um, constitutional violations happening by police officers, more than 1%. An issue of equal importance, and this is one that's really close and personal to me, is ending qualified immunity. You know, I wanna recognize the last couple of weeks, you know, tirelessly, we've worked with community partners, with legislators around the clock 24 seven to really push for public education and push for this bill. While decertification is supported by many across political lines and even law enforcement, eliminating qualified immunity is an issue tied up in as much fiction as fact and has not had that you know, support that we need. Qualified immunity is a legal defense that sets up a very high bar for when a police officer is legally responsible for the damage they've caused to another person. Currently, for an officer to be held responsible, they must have clearly violated an established right of the individual. And in practices, courts have found very few rights clearly established. Essentially what this means is that this outdated doctrine is a free pass for police officers to violate constitutional rights without being held accountable. For many professions, rather you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, or a construction worker, if you violate someone's legal rights, they can be sued and required to pay for the injuries they've caused. However, under the doctrine of qualified immunities, police officers are held to a much lower standard. 
Today, we hear about police shooting after police shooting, where officers are rarely, if ever, held accountable by the criminal legal system, either because prosecutors declined to charge, grand juries declined to indict, or juries declined to convict. Qualified immunity takes away the other avenue that victims of police violence should have available to hold police accountable. If people in Virginia are going to be able to hold police and their departments accountable to pay damages for the harm caused by the excessive use of force or other unconstitutional conduct, the Virginia General Assembly must pass a law allowing people to sue the police in Virginia courts under Virginia laws. The constitutional rights of Virginia and the responsibilities of Virginia law enforcement should be decided by the Virginia courts, by the Virginia juries, and by Virginia judges. We must pass a law that will create a way for people in Virginia to sue police for the harms caused by police violence. The law must state clearly that qualified immunity cannot be used as a defense in those lawsuits, so police no longer have this legal shield to hide behind. Real harm done to an individual deserves real compensation. And yes, you know, throughout the special session, we've heard arguments against ending qualified immunity. One that I've heard so many times is that all of these frivolous lawsuits are gonna cost us millions of dollars. While we may not have an idea of how many suits will be bought, what we do know is that at least nine other states have already enacted civil actions for damages and attorney fees for state constitutional violations and there is no evidence of substantial physical impact. Not to mention that if we have a high physical impact, that means the state is admitting that they believe that's how many constitutional violations are happening through police on a daily basis. We've also heard that ending qualified immunity will bankrupt the officers and their families who are sued. The fact is, is that police officers are nearly always indemnified for any settlements or judgments against them, meaning that their employers, not the officers, end up paying. We have also heard that ending qualified immunity will not allow police officers to do their job as needed, especially in high risk split second decisions. I wanna make one thing clear. Qualified immunity does not take away an officer's ability to make split second decisions. Only officers acting unreasonably and without a genuine threat to their safety would be subject to a lawsuit. This making reasonable split second decisions are protected by the Fourth Amendment. And one of my personal favorites this special session, eliminating qualified community is too complicated. Look, other states have done this and they've done it successfully. And you know, which can provide a roadmap for Virginia. The idea that it's too complicated is merely an excuse not to act. And all we're asking for is that everyone have their day in court if constitutional rights are violated. So let's talk about special session. We're 25 days in and what has happened so far with both of these bills. We are pleased to say that Senate Bill 5030 has passed in the Senate, creating a pathway for stronger decertification standards. And I'd like to give a huge shout out to Senator Locke to help to make that push for that reform. As pleased as we are about decertification, I am, we are just as displeased with the legislators in action around qualified immunity. The House was able to pass House Bill 5013 from a 49 to 45 vote. It was definitely a journey. It had to be resurrected, we needed to flip votes, but the community came together and partners came together to really get this reform out of the House. However, you know, so once a bill passes the House, it goes to the Senate, and then the Senate needs to vote on it. And so this Thursday evening, the Senate killed House Bill 5013 by a 12 to 3 vote. Much of their rationale was that Senate Bill 5030 is a massive police reform bill that would address some of these issues that would have been addressed by eliminating qualified immunity. That is simply not true. A key part of holding police accountable and the departments that hire them accountable is by removing this defense of qualified immunity. And we know when there's no accountability in any profession, that really makes all of us unsafe. You know, legislators have asked that we wait to end qualified immunity, this key policing accountability reform. And you know, I wanna say, you know, something that Senator Lucas said in committee just two days ago, 
that black communities have been waiting for over 400 years. And there is no guarantee that even if we wait till 2021, regular special se uh, regular session, that no more black lives will be lost. So it suffice to say that we will continue to fight and we will continue to push for it for the 2021 legislative session, but we can't do it alone. I want to also mention in addition to our police accountability bills, we have been supporting and uplifting several bills that have been advocated by our community partners um, and our coalitions. We are really active with working with impacted communities and black and brown communities throughout the Commonwealth to look at communi uh, community review boards and school resource officers in our schools, decarcerate through good earning good time credit and banning no knock warrants. As proven defenders of civil rights and civil liberties, we urge each one of you to follow the actions of our legislators during this special session and during the upcoming 2021 session. And if you're seeing something that you don't like, contact your representatives. Remember, they serve at your will and they need to hear your voice. And so what I, was, uh, what I really ask is that we ask our senators why they voted no for House Bill 5013 and why they voted no to ending qualified immunity and really help push this reform forward for this, special, for this regular session for 2021. I cannot emphasize enough that each call counts. They literally tally every single time they hear from you. And we were able to do it in the House. And so I really do believe as a community, if we come together, and demand for change and justice, that it can happen. In the meantime, each and every one of us at the ACLU of Virginia is committed to continuing our efforts to create an inclusive, equitable, and anti-racist state for every Virginian. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ashna. I mean, if you are interested in taking action, you can go to our website, ACLU. Uh, Dot, uh, va org and look for the take action button and you'll see ways that you can interact with the legislature uh, on this issue and and take action on other issues that we um, are currently working on uh, one of the things i think it's important to note is um, that there are i mean i think one of the most disconcerting things i've heard in the last week was when the uh, police uh, representatives, the lobbyists for the state police and the Fraternal Order, Order of Police and the Chiefs Association and the Sheriff's Association got together on Thursday to have a press conference. They characterized everyone who has been working hard on House Bill 5013 and other reform uh, initiatives uh, in the House as anti-police and pro-criminal. And that kind of rhetoric is not helpful and it's not accurate. I mean, the fact that we want to reform policing does not make anybody in that in that work either anti-police or quote unquote pro-criminal. Um, we are for a system that is fair for everybody um, and we are for a system that holds police accountable uh, for illegal conduct, un unconstitutional conduct, and any kind of mis professional misconduct. And it is interesting to note that until this summer uh, the major police associations, and Senator Locke can certainly testify to this, in 2018 when she introduced a bill to add misconduct as a grounds for decertification and to begin the process of developing statewide standards uh, for administering uh, that decertification program, uh, the, all the police people as a whole came together and told her they didn't want statewide standards. They wanted these things to be determined individually at the departmental level. And so at least on that, they've shifted and they seem to have uh, some interest in supporting statewide standards because, you know, all of us should experiencing at least some aspect of policing equally across all the Commonwealth. And there should be minimum acceptable standards for professional conduct that we can all point to as protecting all of us in our communities, regardless of where we live or what department is policing us. So I want to move next to our final staff presentation uh, by Eden Heilman, who's our legal director. Uh, Eden came to us from, uh, from the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, where she was a leader in Louisiana and, uh, and directed their work there. She's going to tell us about our work in the courts to protect our most vulnerable people during the pandemic and to guard civil liberties and the freedom to speak and assemble uh, for all. Thank you, Eden. 
Thanks, Claire. And um, again, just to reiterate what my fellow presenters have said, I want to thank everybody who's here today, um, our supporters, um, and, and, and everybody who has taken the time and energy to support this very, very important work. And um, I'm incredibly grateful for um, to be here, even to hear the stories today of Earl and Christopher. Um, and I am um, hoping we can continue to move all of these issues forward. <clears throat> So um, to start us out, it's been, as you can imagine, a very unusual and challenging year um, in our legal work um, across our organization. And we've had to pivot pretty quickly as a result of what um, has happened um, to address the kind of ongoing crises that we have, um, have been experiencing as a society um, in recent um, uh, months. Um, Ingrid, if you wouldn't mind shifting to the next one. All right, so we're going to start with COVID. Um, earlier, um, my colleague Vishal talked a lot about um, the impact that COVID has had on voting. Um, I'm going to speak to you a little bit about the impact that COVID has had on um, people who are incarcerated in Virginia. Um, uh, you know, uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, it has been absolutely devastating. Um, here's what we know. For a fact, we know that um, almost 3,000 people um, incarcerated in the Department of Corrections custody and in facilities have tested positive for the virus. I do want to emphasize this is just people in VDOT custody. This doesn't include folks in regional jails and local jails. So as I mentioned below, hundreds more um, that are housed in regional and local jails have tested positive for the virus. Um, dozens in VDOT custody have been hospitalized and actually uh, this, this number, the 15 number, um, has been uh, uh, changed. It is now 17 people um, in the Department of Corrections custody have died as a result of the virus. Um, and of course, you know, what we don't know is what's happening in the local and regional jails. There's not one um, source that captures all of that information. So anecdotally, we've heard about outbreaks in various jails and, and um, both local and regional jails throughout the state, but there isn't one single source for that information. Um, and when we don't have an information about the number of deaths um, uh, that have happened in regional and local jails, um, as well as staff deaths, we don't know about that as well. Ingrid, if you could move to the next slide. So, so what we've done in response to um, the, this, you know, horrible conditions that have happened in the, um, in the incarceration context is we joined a lawsuit um, against Governor Northam and his administration, as well as the Department of Corrections, challenging the conditions of confinement related to COVID-19 in Virginia's prisons. Um, and this was something that we brought on, um, that we got involved in in April. Um, we joined a local attorney, Elliot Harding, out of Charlottesville um, in this case, um, and quickly were ordered into settlement negotiations with the Department of Corrections um, based on the urgency of the matter. Um, we were able to enter into a settlement agreement. It's a system-wide settlement agreement for just the Department of Corrections. Now, I do want to note because some people um, think it means all people incarcerated. Unfortunately, it's only people who are who are um, in Virginia Department of Corrections custody. So it doesn't include people who are in the local and regional jails. But um, we now have a systemic settlement agreement. Um, being overseen by the federal court, which means we can go back to the federal court with various um, issues if there are in, um, uh, problems with them actually implementing the terms of the agreement. So the settlement agreement in this case really has three main buckets of, of work that, that um, and provisions that we hope will eventually improve um, the situation for people who are incarcerated. The first has to do, to do with um, the Department of Corrections um, uh, early release project or program. Um, in April, um, the General Assembly passed a budget amendment, which allowed the Virginia Department of Corrections to approve for early release people who had a year or less left on their sentence um, and who met other certain conditions. Um, and they turned that authority over the Department of Corrections to make a project or program to, to figure out how to release those individuals. Um, our settlement agreement specifies certain parts of that that have to be in place in order to help expedite that. So, for example, um, uh, under the Department of Corrections current, um, current processes, um, people can't get a home plan um, until they're six months out from their release date. But we put a provision in place that makes sure that anybody who's at a year mark will start to get their home plan in place so that they can be eligible for release. Um, the second main bucket of the settlement agreement that we, um, that we negotiated has to do with something called conditional pardons. Um, conditional pardons are pardons that can be given by the governor's administration that basically that allows somebody who's incarcerated to be released, either with certain conditions or not. Um, and 
we have provisions in the settlement agreement that say that the governor's administration will prioritize and expedite those individuals who have medical issues that make them particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, um, they will expedite the consideration of those conditional pardons. Um, and the third bucket of, of terms that we got in the settlement has to do with the actual, um, uh, you know, the conditions on the ground in prison. So it includes things like medical treatment, cleaning, sanitation, protective equipment, um, making sure that, um, you know, transfers are, are happening under a safe and secure manner, those sorts of things. Um, so what we know already from this agreement is that, you know, first off, an agreement is only as good as the paper it's on if you don't enforce it, right? And that's just in general, like, legal sense. So we have been heavily and actively enforcing this agreement. Um, we've been utilizing volunteer, lawyer volunteers from across the country, actually, to help us with this. Um, what we know is that, you know, the Department of Corrections has created a very, very bureaucratic process to consider release of people. Um, so, uh, you know, as you can see from this graphic on the slide, um, after 17 weeks, only um, 1,300 roughly people have been reviewed for release. Um, about 980 people have been approved, 506 have been granted, which means they've actually been released. Um, Again, you know, we were optimistic that these numbers would be higher and, and that they would be moving quicker. But as I mentioned, they've created a very bureaucratic process by which to um, go through um, these reviews, which has caused uh, these numbers not to be higher. And so we are consistently um, going back to the Department of Corrections and back to the court to address and raise these issues. What we also know is um, that, and what we've heard on the ground is, um, so we, we, we routinely interview people who are in various um, uh, facilities, uh, VDOC facilities throughout the, the state. Um, and we ask them firsthand about what they're experiencing in terms of conditions. So are they getting access to masks? Are they, um, you know, being, are people with, uh, who have tested positive from the virus being held separately? Um, so we're trying to get firsthand information. And what we do with that information is we then take it to the Department of Corrections and give them an opportunity to fix the issues. Um, if those issues don't get resolved, we then bring them to the court. I um, mean, this has been an ongoing process. I will, it, you know, fully admit that it is imperfect. Um, it is um, very, very difficult, but um, we are actively trying, I think, as much as we can um, in collaboration with our, our partners throughout the state to um, both, one, release all those that are capable of being released, and two, for those that are not, to make sure that they have, at the very minimum, um, the, the safety standards necessary to go on. Oh. Can you go back? I think the slides, oh, it looks like the slides got out of order. Um, okay, so let me next quickly talk about um, uh, our legal response. Um, uh, actually, I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead to the next slide, Ingrid. So, so as a result of, of the um, settlement agreement, um, we also, as I mentioned, we also had this opportunity with regard to people who, who have been, um, uh, or who could potentially be given a conditional pardon by the governor. Um, what we needed to make sure was that people were actually having an opportunity to file for conditional pardons. So quickly after the settlement agreement, um, we partnered with a couple of our other local state community partners as well as some national organizations, um, the Legal Aid Justice Center, Justice Ford, um, the Virginia Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers, and um, the National Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers to start a new project called the Virginia Redemption Project. And what this does is it matches currently incarcerated individuals um, with pro bono lawyers to assist them in completing conditional pardon applications. So basically what the idea is here is that what we know is when people file for conditional pardons, um, those that have a lawyer assisting them have a better chance of having those conditional pardon applications granted. Um, and so this project seeks to provide people with that help. We are, um, as a result of the settlement agreement, we're prioritizing individuals who have um, medical conditions um, because we know that um, the governor has at least claimed to say that he will um, expedite those and consider those first. So those have been our priority, but um, in the future, it could be anyone um, potentially who, who um, could be eligible for a conditional pardon. Um, as you can see here, we've included, um, if you are interested in getting help for you or your loved one, where you would email. Um, and if you are wanting to volunteer, if you're an attorney, a paralegal, legal assistant, um, we, you know, can seek all help. But that is the, um, the uh, note to sign up to help volunteer. Um, and, you know, we, I just want to quickly say, we did just, just recently launch this program. So it is in the very early stages of rolling out. 
Um, and um, we are very optimistic. What we don't know right now, let me say this, we don't know what the governor is currently doing. Um, so for example, we have no knowledge right now of how many conditional pardons they have granted, the governor's administration has granted since um, uh, this was, um, since this uh, settlement agreement was put in place and since the virus started breaking out. Um, so it's hard to operate without, you know, some transparency about what was happening uh, or what is happening. But, um, but our goal is really here to, to try and get some of these processed quicker um, and to get people out um, who need, a, you know, additional medical care and help. Um, and I believe um, additional information was just put into the chat about how to sign up if the if folks are interested. So our next uh, major issue that arose this year, and I don't want to say that, you know, that uh, police brutality arose this year because it certainly didn't, but the um, policing of protesters in response to police brutality has, has taken a, um, uh, uh, you know, an active and priority um, role in our work. Um, so, you know, uh, following George Floyd's tragic murder um, in May, um, protesters throughout Virginia joined across the nation in gathering to demonstrate police brutality and racial inequity. Um, specifically calling out Virginia's own contributions to racial inequality and police brutality. Um, stories such as, you know, um, Mr. Earl's cousin um, are certainly tragic and um, are, are things that have been rallied around in Virginia. Um, dozens of protests in March and demonstrations occurred in Virginia. We know over 50 cities and counties actually had protests. Um, while the vast majority of those were peaceful um, without incidents, and I say that meaning the incidents on behalf of the police, um, many protesters in many um, jurisdictions throughout Virginia um, were met with excessive force by police. Um, and so when I say excessive force, I mean that um, police were using things like tear gas, rubber bullets, um, flash grenades, um, uh, light um, projections, those sorts of things. Um, we call them less lethal forces. So because although they're not, you know, um, they're not, uh, certainly not you know, dispersing a, a, a violent weapon, um, they are still causing significant injury and can cause death. Um, in Richmond, for example, um, that, that was probably, obviously we are all, uh, the office is located in Richmond, so we were close to this uh, firsthand, but the police response was, um, was pretty overwhelming um, to shut down these protests and demonstrations. Um, they used tear gas, flash grenades, rubber bullets, um, and um, they were happening over a matter of days. So we would, um, you know, we would watch, we're watching kind of on the news as over a series of seven, eight, nine days in a row, um, just, just swaths of people were being um, uh, uh, tear gassed and um, shot upon by the police for, for otherwise completely peaceful protests. So um, as a response in late June, um, we filed a lawsuit in Virginia State Court um, on behalf of for the Virginia Student Power Network, as well as uh, four individual plaintiffs against the city of Richmond, the Richmond Police Department, and the Virginia State Police. Um, and basically what we alleged in our lawsuit was the fact that um, they were the, the police um, powers that be were declaring an unlawful assembly under Virginia law and then using that as, as pretext to, to tear gas and pepper spray and, and flashbang all of the people who were gathering. Um, we specifically drew um, drew attention to one individual um, protest that was planned by the Virginia Student Power Network, which was a sit-in um, across the street from, from City Hall. Um, there was, uh, you know, uh, probably, you know, several hundred people there that were literally sitting watching a movie um, when police declared the area an unlawful assembly um, and, um, and proceeded to use um, uh, less lethal methods on all of the uh, folks who were assembled there. Um, in the lawsuit, we allege violations of Virginia's Constitution's right to free speech and peaceably assemble, um, as well as violations of the U.S. Constitution's First, Fourth, and Fourteenth Amendments. Um, we requested an, a, a, what's called a temporary restraining order, a TRO. And basically what this is, is it was our request to actually get before a judge immediately to say to the court, you know, we need a, an immediate order to stop this ongoing um, uh, violence against protesters uh, perpetrated by police. Um, unfortunately, we lost the, the TRO, um, but, um, and we don't know if this is attributed to our ability, you know, our, our filing of this lawsuit or, if, you know, changing circumstances, but um, the police have not engaged in um, any large-scale consecutive um, 
uh, tear gassing incidents since the, the filing of our lawsuit. Um, so um, that has been one. Um, they definitely have still engaged in excessive force. I will not say that that has gone away, but um, but that but the ongoing use of tear gas um, and rubber bullets has um, has curtailed. Um, but the case is going on. So. We will be back in court in November, um, uh, answering the um, police department's motions to dismiss the case. Um, and we will continue to fight and, and monitor the situation as it goes forward. Um, and I think that is it for me. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much, Eden, for sharing that important information about how we're doing our advocacy in the, in the courts, as well as now we've heard about how we're doing it publicly and in legislative work and in the courts. And so now we're gonna turn to your questions and, and Meredith is gonna help us by, she's read all of them and she's gonna help by asking the questions and then either I'll be able to answer them or, or we'll ask other folks who are on the panel uh, to answer them for us. So Meredith, what's our first question? Yeah, uh, so I'm Meredith Mason. I'm the Senior Communications Manager and, and we'll be taking about the next 10 minutes to answer questions. Uh, so the first one is, uh, do we support the constitutional amendment regarding gerrymandering? Uh, the answer to that question is yes. I mean, we have supported that constitutional amendment since its inception and here's why. It is the only opportunity to guarantee that uh, residents of Virginia, actual voters, can participate in the uh, line drawing process uh, in, this, uh, in this decade. So if this constitutional amendment fails, uh, there will be no constitutional guarantee of a resident participation in, in, the, in the drawing of lines for apportioning both the federal uh, electoral seats, the Congress seats, and the Senate, uh, the Senate obviously statewide, or in apportioning uh, drawing lines and districting for um, our state and local elections. Um, if we, if it doesn't pass, then all bets are off. The process will stay, could stay unchanged. It's basically a political process whose current uh, focus is on protecting incumbents. And we will uh, have to wait until the uh, next census cycle in 2030 uh, before we could really actually implement a change. So um, we have supported it since its inception. We continue to support the idea and the, um, the possibility of having voters actually be able to participate in the process of choosing who their representatives are instead of having representatives um, and legislators choose their voters. Thank you, Claire. Um, so the next one is about uh, voter ID laws. So I'd like to bring Jenny back up. Uh, since she's our voting expert. Um, so Ginny, uh, one of the questions was, are college IDs an acceptable form of ID at the ballot box? Oh no, my, my, <laughs> my microphone died. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. A little bit? Okay. Um, for people who don't know this, my computer is terrible for my microphone, so I'm gonna yell the answer. <laughs> Um, well, you're fine. <laughs> you're good. Yes, you can. Uh, you can use a student ID, um, it, and, and it doesn't have to be um, a university in Virginia. It can be any community college or uh, university uh, in in the country. Great, thank you, uh, Vishal. Uh, if you can. Just a second. I can't actually hear you. <laughs> um, so let me try and work on that. You might. Could you maybe go to some other questions and come back to me? Yes. Okay. Uh, Vishal, um, the next question's for you. Uh, is there a way to access the records of purged voters? And can someone who is denied or purged, uh, can they challenge it? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so, you know, voter purges are, uh, it's obviously a concern in nationwide that basically it's, um, they're, every state's required to do some list maintenance of the voter rolls. They're always doing list maintenance, finding out whether, you know, if people have moved out of state or, um, or have just moved to a different county and have, uh, are trying to register somewhere else or have passed away for, uh, for a lot of reasons, they, um, states are uh, maintaining their voter rolls regularly. And if they're doing so too aggressively, 
um, and that, that can be described as a purge. And there are federal laws about, and state laws, about when they can do it and, and how they can do it. Um, the, uh, you're supposed to get notice uh, it before uh, you're taken off the rolls. And so that's really the best time to, and if you get that notice, to say, uh, if it, for, the, for the, whatever reason the state thinks you're either no longer living where you are or no longer eligible to vote, then you can kind of respond to that notice. But um, the way you might find out that you are not registered um, when you should be is um, really the best way is to keep checking your registration, uh, making sure that there's, um, uh, that, that, you're, um, uh, that you remain um, registered and on the rolls and to kind of go back and register. If you find out that you have been um, purged um, without any notification, um, then uh, that's a problem, and um, you should be uh, you, you should contact um, the, probably the best place to contact is either um, us or through really election protection. Um, so um, that's a nonpartisan national hotline that keeps track of a lot of these issues. And if um, there are some issues with the with the uh, state's process for notifying voters and making sure that eligible people remain registered, then that's something that. Um, we and other groups would want to look into. Um, so I would, um, uh, I guess that's that's the best way. Make sure you keep checking the registration, make sure that you're staying registered. And um, if you're seeing any issues, contact Election Protection. The number there is 866-OUR-VOTE. Um, you can also Google it and enter in a hotline there. And, and that's something that's a uh, organization that we've worked with in the past leading up to elections to make to protect people's right to vote. Thank you. And we also have uh, a lot of resources on our website, acluva.org, uh, that have all that information. There's that number on our website that Vishal mentioned. Um, so that can be another resource for you. Uh, so our next question, I'll send back to Claire. Uh, we had a couple questions about inequalities in housing practices. And we had a lawsuit this year with Home of Virginia that addressed one of those inequities. Uh, can you talk about that? Sure. Um, I mean, the reality is, you know, the ACLU fits in a, in a constellation of a lot of organizations and all of us uh, are very conscious of each other's mission and how we can engage with each other in advocacy around issues across a, a full range. And on housing, we look to home, how housing opportunities make, made equal. We look to the Legal Aid Justice Center and other organizations that uh, have both uh, economic justice and housing as their primary missions. And in this particular case, we joined with home in a piece of litigation that challenged the rule of a, of a big apartment complex owner that has you know, uh, facilities and apartments across the Commonwealth. Uh, and we joined with them in challenging a, a rule that they had that essentially prohibited anybody who'd ever been uh, convicted of a crime from being able to rent in their, uh, in their facilities. And the good news is that we were able through that litigation and working with home to assure that that policy was changed. We reached a, an agreement that really set a standard for everybody in terms of, of making sure that people aren't reflexively disqualified from being able to rent anywhere uh, just because of a past uh, criminal history. So we're very uh, positive about that. You can find out more about that on our website at acluva.org. If you look under our work and click on legal, you can find the home case and read more about the work that we've done to assure that housing is made fairly available to everyone, uh, regardless of you know, past criminal history. Thank you. And our last question, Claire, is about HB 5013, the bill to end qualified immunity. Uh, why was that bill defeated? And what do you recommend as the model for bringing it back up next year? Um, well, you know, the, the one thing I would say is the special session isn't over. Um, and while it's clear that House Bill 5013 itself, uh, because of some procedural uh, dancing, cannot be reconsidered in the Senate, 
uh, under the Senate rules, that doesn't mean there might not be another place where another bill that's moving through the system could become a vehicle uh, for an amendment that could, you know, address some of those issues. Um, the Senate, the Senate was, I mean, there are a lot of different arguments that were made. One of them is that Senate Bill 5030 itself somehow addresses this issue. I, I think that's not accurate or right. Um, it is the case that the Senate bill includes some very specific language about what police people can and can't do when they're engaging in arresting people in terms of the kind of force they can use. But that language was pretty much rewritten at the insistence of police to be essentially on all fours with the current constitutional standards that are in place under the federal constitutional definition of unreasonable or excessive force. And so there's a huge loophole in the middle of it, which is that it, the, uh, which is the loophole of reasonableness. And that loophole would invite back into any conversation about whether that could be a, a state statute that could be relied on in saying that an officer had acted unconstitutionally and in violation of a statutory right, which would theoretically override qualified immunity. The minute the reasonableness factor comes back into play, qualified immunity comes back into play. And, um, and so, you know, anything that is not what House Bill 5013 was, which is a specific new cause of action under state law to bring an action in state court to vindicate your constitutional rights under the Virginia Constitution, um, we, we can't pass a law in Virginia that overrides what the federal courts are saying about, you know, federal constitutional claims, but we can give Virginians an alternative route to hold people accountable in our state courts. And we're going to keep fighting for that. Um, it, it is absolutely clear that the police are going to keep fighting against it. And I think it's, um, not unusual, uh, for, uh, people who perceive their power to be uh, under um, some kind of, of, uh, of attack uh, to respond um, by fighting back and fighting back hard. And if you look at the police uh, press conference this week and the kind of rhetoric they were willing to use to, to uh, uh, you know, disqualify or discredit um, their, the people who are advocates for change, um, you know that this is a, a hard battle and we're going to keep fighting it. Um, it is absolutely necessary that we get to a point where police operate in a culture of transparency, a culture in which um, people who are being policed are seen as their authorizing environment and where people are held accountable for misconduct. And we're going to keep working across both decertification and uh, uh, court access to make sure that accountability is present. Thank you. Uh, and that's the the last question that we have time for, unfortunately, um, but I will take this opportunity to plug our social media uh, because we answer questions there all the time. We also have resources like when uh, when this bill was being heard earlier this week, we posted a call script for people to take last minute action. So that's a good resource for everyone. So I'll turn it back to you, Claire. All right. Um, I want to introduce uh, Steve Kahn. Um, this is the point in our program where we are going to be doing the official work of our chapter in Northern Virginia. This is a joint meeting of our uh, statewide affiliate and our Northern Virginia chapter. And the president of the Northern Virginia chapter, Steve Kahn, is going to take over at this point. Good afternoon. Thank you, Claire. Um, so we have a chapter for, I know there's some people on the call that are, can you hear me all right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Some people on the call that uh, are uh, in the central part of the state or maybe southern part of the state. We have a chapter in the northern part of the state because there's a great many ACLU members of the Commonwealth that reside there. There's been a chapter for decades, a long time, because people want to get together and want to keep an ear of what the ACLU is doing on in the... Uh, affiliate level in, in Richmond, and it gives us the opportunity to meet occasionally and hear more about the affiliates activities and also do anything we want to do that is aligned with the affiliate 
uh, that may be some events that help promote uh, civil liberties within the Commonwealth. Of course, a big part of the ACLU is litigation, lobbying the legislature in Richmond, and that's all the affiliates work. So for us in Northern Virginia, it's maybe um, embarking on events or activities with help provide forums to um, amplify the ACLU's mission and uh, spread education about civil liberties and things of that nature. So due to the population, we usually have chapter board members who are also affiliate board members in Richmond. So that is a great opportunity for us, keep us aligned with what the affiliate is up to and keeps us abreast with all sorts of activities. Uh, we currently have two members and they're key. So Steve Levinson, who was, you heard from earlier, who is president of the uh, Virginia ACLU, and Ed Rosenthal, who's head of the affiliate legal panel, they are both members of our chapter board. So when we meet, they are there. They, you know, they're always constantly on the agenda. What's happening at the affiliate? We get to hear a lot of details of uh, the decision making of the affiliate and some backstories on maybe why and why not uh, certain positions were taken, uh, the ACLU of uh, Virginia. So that's really rich to hear from uh, members of the affiliate uh, board in Richmond. We usually have about uh, 10 to 15 members. Uh, they're appointed for three years. We also get involved in, uh, we don't have any paid staff, so we're just volunteers. So what we do other than meet is any activities that we have volunteers for that want to have an interest in taking an active role in volunteering to do something. Our main thing every year is the annual Crab Fest, which some of you might be uh, familiar with. We put on a big show at the uh, Fort Hunt uh, Park in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, if you've never been there, you, know, you might look at the next year. We didn't have one this year because of the COVID, but we've had one every year. You might look at the um, site and advertisements next year, and you're certainly welcome to come to that. That provides an opportunity for the Northern Virginia members to come together, socialize, catch up on old friends, and provide a forum for the affiliate, the executive director, to come and talk about the status of events and happenings at the affiliate level. We've also uh, annually usually provided a legislative forum that we've called in joint concert with the affiliate in Northern Virginia. Also, we partnered with the uh, Universal Unitarian Church of Arlington, where we come there and members could come and hear again, what are the initiatives that the affiliate is working on in regard to legislature, legislation in Virginia. Uh, last year, the affiliate also uh, did a wonderful job of partnering with like civil uh, liberty type organizations. So we had representatives from other organizations talk to us about their efforts and it was very informative. And over the years, we've also had a lot of events like, uh, you know, membership drives or debates or forums or movies or um, anything that uh, promotes a forum that uh, provides some education to the public on what the ACLU is up to and maybe they'd like to join as a member. Um, if you're interested in maybe uh, you live up here in the Northern Virginia area and like to be interested in being a board member, I would just uh, ask you to go to the Virginia website and we have our email address there and a phone number there. You can call and we'll, we'll have somebody uh, contact you and give you some more information. Um, we are always looking for improved diversity with our board members. So if you happen to be a, a minority that you identify with and uh, interested, we'd be especially uh, receptive to your um, work in that area. Uh, the other thing I like to mention is our business portion is we uh, go to the Northern Virginia members and ask you to endorse the people on the chapter board. Again, we have people serving three year tours or 10 years. And so it's on a staggered basis. So this year we have two people up for um, your endorsement. Uh, one is Steve Levinson, who's the <laughs> president of the ACLU. So we don't think uh, that'll be a problem with your endorsement of him. Uh, he wants, he's been a, a member of the uh, Northern Virginia chapter for years and years, and he's a great conduit of information, of course, detailed information about the ACLU. We also have another uh, new uh, member, Christian Genest, 
who is a, a native of France and has been over here for years in America. And he is, uh, has a wonderful resume uh, in France. He was a law clerk intern for the French Supreme Court, uh, working on research drafting decisions for uh, fundamental human rights, including right to education and asylum in France. He's been a research assistant, a survey data analyst, a data scientist, a fellow with various uh, federal agencies and some uh, entities. And his current job is a data scientist for the government of the District of Columbia. So we certainly wholeheartedly endorse your, um, uh, solicit your endorsement of him. Uh, at the Crab Fest, I usually have asked for, um, you know, eyes and nays uh, uh, verbally to see if you've all voted for that. We're in a new environment here. We were going to have, um, see if we could be capable, and here it is. Uh, if you would like to, if you're an attendee of this and from Northern Virginia, you could simply just click yes or no, and that gives us some uh, feedback on if you're approving Steve Levinson and Christian Jeunesse as uh, Northern Virginia chapter board members. So we'd appreciate you voting. We do not subscribe to the president's theory of voting twice. We just think it's, uh, you know, not that democratic. So we ask you to only vote once. And uh, I'll end it with, um, we, uh, Northern Virginia, uh, certainly always appreciate the work that everybody on the affiliate board and the affiliate staff do every day. You work long hours, you don't get paid that much, and you're dedicated, passionate people about advancing civil liberties, justice, equality among people in this commonwealth, and that's what we're all passionate about, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Steve Kahn. And I want to turn now to Steve Levinson for some final remarks um, in his dual role as a member of the Northern Virginia Chapter Board and as president of our statewide board of directors. Steve? Thanks, Claire. And thanks, Steve, for the comments. Um, we've reached the conclusion of this year's joint annual meeting of the ACLU of Virginia and our Northern Virginia Chapter. I just want to take a moment to thank each of you for taking the time today to join us. Uh, the ACLU of Virginia could not do what it does without your membership and support. It is our hope that today you got a glimpse of what your support enables this great organization to do, to have real impact on real people. I want to thank, sincerely thank, the partners who joined us today to share their truths. Uh, Senator Locke, Christopher Rashad Green and Earl Lewis Jr. The ACLU of Virginia could not do what we do without the great partners in the community and the legislature. And finally, um, I want to thank Claire and her team, her incredible team for both their presentations today and for the incredible work they do every day. Um, as the board president, I'm, you know, more involved than maybe some of the other board members, and I am just constantly amazed to see all of the things in which they're so deeply involved. I guess because when it comes to creating equality for all, there's never a shortage of issues to tackle. Um, so thank you, thank you to the staff, to Claire, and, and to all of you. Uh, thanks for joining us. Enjoy the rest of your day. Please stay safe and vote. I'll turn it back to Claire. All right. Uh, I want to add my final thanks to all of you for coming to the meeting today. We are incredibly grateful you chose to join us. And we hope you'll stay in touch by becoming a card carrying member of the ACLU if you aren't one already. And checking out our website to find out more about the things we talked about today and take a look at our annual report. And sign up for our email list and follow us on social media on all the social media challenges, channels where ACLUVA, very simple. Um, you can find out how to do all the things we've talked about today by visiting our website at ACLUVA.org. And we look forward to working with you to make even more positive changes in the year ahead. As Steve said, please stay safe and keep yourselves well. And above all, please be resilient.
Thank you so much for being here. Bye. <laughs>